scripture that we read this morning from the book of Acts is one that I'm sure is familiar to all of you, or most of you at least. It is part of the second book that Luke wrote. Of course, he wrote the gospel which bears his name, but he also wrote this book of Acts. And in both of those books, he mentions in the first part of the first chapter that he is writing to a certain Theophilus. Of course, we do not know exactly who this person was that Luke was writing to, but the way he addresses him seems to indicate that Theophilus was a man of some importance. He is called most excellent Theophilus, Theophilus or most noble Theophilus some, in some translations. One who was a man of importance. It's interesting that Theophilus' name means the one whom God loves. Of course, I think this was a, very, a literal person with that name and yet, we might realize that everyone to, who reads this letter or this missive, this book, is one, in fact, whom God loves. So much, in fact, that he gave his only begotten son that we might live through him. In this second book of Luke, he reminds Theophilus about the closing of our Lord's ministry, which he had also summarized in his Gospel of Luke, those last days which led to his death and then his resurrection. And he speaks of 40 days in which the Lord Jesus spoke with his disciples about the kingdom of God, as we see here in this third verse of Acts 1. And then the famous dialogue in which Jesus told his disciples that they were to receive God's Holy Spirit, and they were to wait in Jerusalem until that should happen. And they asked the question, Lord, are you going to restore the kingdom now to Israel? That kingdom which had been Israel's long ago, which they had lost through disobedience, which had been promised to be restored. And so they say, Lord, are you going to do this now? It's interesting that the Lord replies, not that they're wrong in their expectation of a restoration, but rather that they're wrong in expecting it to happen now because they had a job to do first, a job which we also have, the Great Commission to carry the message of Jesus, as he says here, not only to Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, but to the ends of the earth, as we read in the NIV. Meanwhile, what happened? I'd like to read verses 9, 10, and 11 from the NIV. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. At the very beginning of this commission in which the believers are to go to proclaim the message of Jesus, the crucified and risen Lord and ascended Lord to the right hand of the Father, they are also told as he is departing, this very same person this same Jesus that you see going away into the heavens is going to come back again the same way that you've seen him go away. This hope then was given at the very outset of the church age to the believers 
that the Lord Jesus, now gone away visibly from our presence, is going to return. So I've entitled my message that Jesus will return. Now I know that some people feel that that's a rather fanatical hope. They cannot imagine such a thing. Even some <clears throat> who profess to be believers, some who profess to believe in Jesus as Savior and Lord, simply find it very difficult for one reason or another to accept that this very person who lived on this earth, who dwelt among men, who suffered and was put to death for our sins, and who rose again, is going to someday be back here on this earth once more. As I say, that is very hard for some to accept. And yet, as we look at the scriptures, and if we claim, really, to take the word of God seriously, claim to believe that this really is God's word to us, it's very hard for me to understand how anyone who makes that claim could deny that the Bible really teaches that Jesus is coming back again. Let's look for a few moments at some of his own statements during his earthly ministry. I'd like to turn to Matthew 16 to start that, verses 24 through 27. Jesus had just told his disciples for the first time that he was going to be betrayed into the hands of sinful men and that he was going to be killed and he was going to rise the third day. This is the first time he had told them that. This is in verses 21 and 22. This is when Peter rebuked the Lord and said, Lord, this must not happen to you. This cannot happen to you. Never let it happen. And Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. But let's notice what he went on to say. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me will find it. What good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world, yet forfeits his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what he has done. The Son of Man, he says, is going to come. Come where? Well, Jesus is standing on the earth at that very point in time. He seems to be implying that he's going to come back to where he is, namely on the earth. And when he comes, he says, he's going to come in his Father's glory. <coughs> and he's going to come with his angels. When Jesus came the first time, as we've recently remembered in the Christmas commemoration, he didn't come that way. He didn't come in glory, in power. He didn't come royally, being born in a stable, living in a very poor, as the world looks at it, way economically but he comes the second time he says in glory in power with the angels the Lord mentioned this very same thing later in Matthew the 25th chapter in verse 31 <clears throat> he says there when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him he will sit on his throne in heavenly glory. King James says, when he comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. The NIV here has added the word heavenly. It's not in the Greek text. 
but it is indicative of the kind of glory it will be. It will be a heavenly glory because the Lord is coming from heaven. And he says here, he comes not alone, but all the holy angels with him. All the holy angels with him. This is a scene which many have tried to imagine. Some of you perhaps have seen artists' conception of that scene, of Jesus coming in the sky, surrounded by all the angels in great splendor and so on. Artists have endeavored to paint the picture. And I'm sure it's a hard picture to paint. The word picture here should help all of us, however, to somehow visualize what Jesus is trying to describe here for us. A glorious return accompanied by the powerful angels of God and the glory of God after which he will sit upon that throne that was promised to him. Usually we think that the last words of anyone are important words. The last words that we may have. We have in the book of Revelation the very last words that Jesus left. It wasn't just those words he left with the apostles there in Acts 1. But through John, his apostle, who wrote the book of Revelation, he left some of his own words for us. And the last words were in verse 20 of chapter 22. He who testifies to these things says, and remember it was Jesus who did the testifying to John. He says, yes, I am coming soon. Yes, I am coming soon. And then John replies, Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Remember that John was on the Isle of Patmos at this time. He was suffering imprisonment for his faith, for his ministry. That's why he was on the Isle of Patmos. He had been banished there by the Roman authorities for his ministry, for his faith, for his teaching about Christ. And so we can well imagine that John was eager for a change in circumstances. He was eager when Jesus says, I am coming soon. John immediately says, Amen. Come, Lord. That's what he wanted with all his heart was the return of his Lord. Going back again to this, these words of Jesus in Matthew, back in Matthew 25, which we were looking at a moment ago. <clears throat> After the Lord had said these things, or before he had said these things about coming in his glory, he gave a parable, the parable of the talents, beginning in verse 14. This parable was, of course, if we would take time to read it, is to show that his disciples are to be faithful in serving him while he is gone. He starts it out by saying, again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his property to them. Of course, it's not very hard to realize that the Lord is teaching his disciples that they, while he is gone, have a responsibility to take care of his business. He says he entrusted his property to them. The message, actually, that he had been preaching for three and a half years, which now he gives to them to preach that message of the kingdom of God, which he said must be preached in all the world as a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. In the preceding chapter, verse 14, he had said that. But I'd like you to notice what he says in verse 19 in this parable. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. After a long time, this master comes back again and he deals with his servants. He finds out whether they have been faithful in carrying out the commission 
that he gave them to fulfill. He returns. The picture, of course, that I see here, and I trust that you see, is that this Lord of ours who went away is going to come back. And when he comes, he will, as we read earlier in Matthew, reward his servants according to their stewardship. These are his servants, these who are already his people. Then they are rewarded according to their works, but they are already his. They are already his. Salvation is not by works, but reward is. Turning to the words of the Apostle Peter, this one who was present when they asked Jesus, Lord, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel now? I'd like you to notice what this same Peter says in chapter 3 of this book of Acts. After they have received the Holy Spirit, after they have been fully enlightened of all things, remember the Lord Jesus had said to them earlier, before his crucifixion, he said, I have many things to say unto you now, but you can't receive them. Later on, they were going to understand when the Spirit of God came. We read here in Acts 3 that Peter says to the people of Israel who had gathered around there in Jerusalem after the healing of the crippled man, he says, repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord, and that he, that is he the Lord, and here obviously the word Lord means the Lord God, that he may send the Christ who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. He, that is Jesus, must remain in heaven <clears throat> until the time comes for God to restore everything as he promised long ago through his holy prophets. You'll notice that Peter is not denying the restoration that God had promised. Actually, the disciples were not wrong in asking whether God would restore the kingdom because the Old Testament had clearly promised that he would. Their problem was understanding when. Here Peter answers that particular question. He says that the Lord Jesus must remain in heaven. He must stay there, says Peter, until the time comes when God sends him back again to restore everything that God promised by the mouth of his holy prophets. That is to say, all that is said in the Old Testament about that promised restoration. Jesus then, says Peter, is coming back again, and he comes back again precisely because his Father will send him from heaven to do the work of restoration. When we think of that, we must ask ourselves, what needs to be restored? Certainly not heaven. There's no problem there. The problem is here, is it not? This is where the restoration needs to take place. And here is where the one who is to do the work of restoration needs to be to carry it on. And that's why he told us to pray, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. It needs to be done on earth. And that can only happen when that prayer is finally answered in the coming and the of the kingdom and the coming of the king to bring about the change. But Peter wasn't the only one who spoke about this. The other apostles did as well. It's interesting how Paul writes to the Corinthians in the first chapter of, of 1 Corinthians. To these Corinthians, he says in verse 4, he says, I always thank God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. For in him you have been enriched in every way, in all your speaking and in all your knowledge, because our testimony about Christ was confirmed in you. Therefore you do not lack any spiritual gift 
And Paul will talk about those spiritual gifts later in chapters 12, 13, and 14. But he says you don't lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will keep you strong to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. He, pre uh, he describes the church here as waiting. He says you're waiting for the Lord Jesus to be revealed. You're waiting for him to come. And you will be kept strong to the end, to the day of the Lord Jesus, he says. Very clear reference to the coming of the Lord. Also in chapter 15 of this same letter, that wonderful chapter about the resurrection, in verse 23, as he talks about when that will happen, he says, each in his own turn, Christ the first fruits. Then when he comes, when he comes, those who belong to him. Until he comes, we're waiting. That's the word Paul had used in chapter 1. We're waiting for his coming. Not waiting, twiddling our thumbs, hopefully, but waiting, faithfully fulfilling the commission that we have been called upon to do and to fulfill. Also, the writer of Hebrews, some think it was Paul, we don't really know, who wrote the book of Hebrews. But in that book, too, in the ninth chapter, in the 28th verse, we have a further word on this. He says, So Christ was once sacrificed to take away the sins of many people, and he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are, notice again the word, to those who are waiting for him. Are you waiting for Jesus? Are you waiting for Jesus? That's the way Paul and the writer of Hebrews describe the believers, waiting for Jesus. Waiting until he shall appear the second time. We talk about the second coming of Jesus. That's where that comes from. If he's going to appear the second time, that implies that he's got to appear visibly because that's how he appeared the first time. He was here the first time visibly, tangibly, personally. No doubt about it. He was right here on the earth. And if the second means anything at all, it's got to mean that he's going to be here just as visibly, just as tangibly, just as really as he was the first time. Otherwise, second is meaningless. It has to mean that. Or second is in, in, irrelevant as a word in this context. It looks back to the first, doesn't it? When there's a second, there's a first. The very fact that he can use the word here, appear the second time, means that it's got to be appearing in some sense like it was the first time. Again, what, P, what, what the apostles were told there in Acts 1.11, this same Jesus who is taken away from you in, uh, into heaven will come again in the same manner. The same idea. Also James, the next book after Hebrews, James, the brother of Jesus, the fifth chapter of his book, the seventh and eighth verses. He says, be patient then, brothers. Again, the idea of waiting, wait patiently. Be patient then, brothers, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop and how patient he is for the autumn and spring rains. You too be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against each other, brothers, or you'll be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Now, I know that almost 2,000 years have passed since those words have been written, and I know also that that has been an offense to some. They say, well, how can the, the Bible be written this way 
Here we've been waiting for 2,000 years and Jesus still has not come. And from that then, they take it that it's all right to deny his return or explain it away somehow or spiritualize it. However, remember that Peter had written too that one day with the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. The Lord does not reckon time as we do. To us it seems like a long time. And it is. But really, what are 2,000 years in light of eternity when you think about it? It's just a drop in the bucket. As the old hymn says, when we've been there 10,000 years, you know, in that kingdom of God, we're still praising him. It doesn't. The passage of time is so irrelevant when we think in God's terms, even though it is relevant to us in a very strong way. Going back again to the book of Hebrews, this time to the 10th chapter, <clears throat> verses 36 and 37. He says, you need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. For in just a very little while, again, 2,000 years, but in the Bible terminology and God's reckoning, just a very little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. Now that might seem like a repetition to you, but it isn't. He says, he who is coming. That's one of the terms to describe the Messiah, the coming one, Jesus, our Lord. The coming one. He who is coming will come. There's both the theoretical side of it and the practical side. The theoretical side is that he's called the coming one. The practical side is that he's going to come. He will come, says the scripture. And when that happens, he will not delay. But my righteous one will live by faith, and if he shrinks back, I will not be pleased with him. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who believe and are saved. Are you brother, sister, friend of those? You must ask yourself. Paul said, examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. That's up to each one of us to do, to examine ourselves, to see whether we have come into Jesus Christ, our Savior. This is a very practical doctrine, very practical. Some people think it's fanatical, but it's practical. Famous writer of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, Gibbon, English historian, his book is still considered a great classic. And Gibbon was not really a believer. But one thing he wrote that's very interesting about those early Christians who were persecuted so by the Roman government in the early centuries, he said that as long as the doctrine of the second coming of Christ and his millennial reign continued to be taught among the Christians, he says, and these are his exact words, produced the most salutary effects on the faith and practice of the Christians. Well, the word salutary is kind of an old-fashioned word. Literally means healthful. Healthful. Gibbon says, even as one who himself did not necessarily believe it, he said, as long as the Christians held that, and he's implying that they eventually gave it up, and unfortunately, that became the case, ultimately. They didn't really begin to uh, keep on looking for the Lord to really come. They began to settle down when the Roman Empire became Christian, you know. Constantine made Christianity the state religion, ultimately. No longer did it seem that important and that valuable for the Lord Jesus to return. But as long as they held that hope, says Gibbon, it produced great spiritual effects among the believers. 
And when they gave it up, the world descended into what we call the Dark Ages and the medieval period. <clears throat> what does this hope really do for us? The Apostle Paul very clearly states it in 1 Thessalonians 3. <clears throat> what this belief, what this hope in the second coming can do in our lives as believers. Verses 12 and 13, he says, May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else, just as ours does for you. May he strengthen your hearts so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus comes with all his holy ones. He's implying that our trust in that second coming and our looking forward to his coming has something to do with our love and our blamelessness and our holiness. Isn't that just what Gibbon had implied? This is what Paul st clearly states, that our looking for the coming of Jesus, if we really believe that, if we really hold it, and we're really looking for him and waiting for him, it's going to change our lives. It's going to change the way we live. It's going to affect the way we love one another because we want to be found, as he says here, blameless and holy when he comes with all his holy ones, when he comes with the holy angels, as we read there in Matthew, because he's going to come with all those holy ones. And then we will be tested to see where we stand with relation to that. I'd like to close with the words of Jesus himself again in Matthew 24. <clears throat> this main famous Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24 is one that is quoted many, many times by Bible students, students of prophecy. But the Lord says in verse 36, no one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Nobody knows he's talking about the day of his return. He, no one knows when it will be. But he, he says the Father knows. Then in verse 42 he says, Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. Does anybody here know? I don't know. I don't know when he's coming. I know there are signs in the world today that look like his coming may be soon, but I don't know when he's coming exactly, nor do you. But he says, understand this. If the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. So you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. He's going to come, and you don't know when he's coming. The point is to be ready all the time because you don't know. There won't be an opportunity for you to say, oh, he's coming now, I better get ready. You better be ready when he comes. You better be ready when he comes. And so, as we say, Jesus will return. And I believe we have strong and firm scriptural foundation for that hope, for that belief, for that confidence. And I pray that each of you this morning have that hope, that confidence, and that expectation in your heart and in your life as you wait patiently for the coming, the return, the visible appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Our Father in heaven, we're so grateful for the promise of your son's return. We're so grateful, Father, that you will send him and that he may remain in heaven only until the times of restitution of all things spoken by the mouth of all your holy prophets since the world began. Oh, Father, help us to understand and be ready for that day, to prepare the way by announcing to others in word and by our lives 
that great coming kingdom and the coming king. Oh, Father, be with us. Grant us to be filled with the, that expectation and with the conviction that we must announce the message wherever we can in all the world faithfully so that others too will be ready to receive the Lord Jesus Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords. For we pray it in his dear name. Amen.